Okay, I'm going to be going over some of the basic networking devices that you'll see on a, a business network or, you know, even a home network at some times. Um, so the first device we're going to talk about is the cable modem. So this is a cable modem. You've seen these. They've got, uh, usually if you're in a Comcast or Cox network uh, in your home or, or for your business and you're a small business with less than, say, 50 employees, uh, most companies use cable modems still. Uh, nothing wrong with them. They're about the best bang for the buck. Usually the performance is pretty decent. Um, they can be a little spotty on reliability, but overall it seems to be a pretty good solution for most small businesses. And, and most of our customers are on cable modems, um, our small, medium-sized uh, customers. So, so on the back, you're going to have where your coaxial cable plugs in, uh, screws in really, and then you've got a USB port if you were wanting to, <laughs> to plug it into your computer directly, not recommended. That's kind of a throwback from uh, many, many, many years ago when cable modems came out. You just plug it directly into your computer using USB cable to get your internet. Uh, and you got an ethernet port and of course power. So your ethernet port would come uh, from the cable modem into your firewall. We're gonna get into the firewall in just a minute, but the first thing I wanna tell you about this is people have been trained by cable companies to do something very dangerous, and that is to push this little bitty, maybe you can see it in there, little bitty, let me get out of the picture, see if that'll focus. I don't think it's gonna focus well. Uh, there's a little bitty keyhole there with a button in it, and that is the reset button. So on a cable modem, when you push the reset, it doesn't really do anything. It just resets the cable modem, everything's back to normal. Maybe everything starts working, great. So what people have learned over time is I'm just gonna push the reset button on any device I have on my network, be it my office or my home, and that should fix the problem. It always worked on my cable modem at home. Well, that's gonna get you into some trouble. So first thing I'm gonna do here is we're gonna move over to a firewall. Now this is what I call a, what everyone calls, <laughs> a consumer grade firewall. Uh, it's made by Cisco, really it's, it's a Linksys. So Cisco acquired Linksys or merged with them many years ago. Um, Linksys stuff is not bad, it's just not business class. It doesn't have the feature set you need, it doesn't have the security at all that you need. Um, you're not gonna be able to update this thing automatically, you're gonna have to manually update it, no one's ever gonna update it. So they really just sit out there as a huge uh, risk for your organization once you put in this kind of firewall. And we strongly discourage anyone from having these and we do not allow any of our customers to have these on their network and we only do business class support. So in a home, not necessarily bad. Um, I don't run them in my home, even though they're cheap and it would suffice. I don't wanna keep it up to date. So I run a firewall that updates itself all the time. So it is a firewall, so you'll see there's ports in the back. It's got some network ports where you can plug your ethernet device uh, into it, uh, be it a computer that plugs in, uh, coming from your cable modem. And you would sit that in a closet somewhere in your house, uh, and it may do wireless or it may not do wireless. The problem comes in, like I said before, whenever you push the reset button on your cable modem to get it working. Well, you would think, well, that didn't work, so now I'm gonna push the reset button, this real obvious blue button on my uh, firewall, firewall router, they're, it, they're synonymous pretty much in this day and age with most business uh, businesses, uh, networking devices. So, so your firewall router, you hold that down, you reset your, your router, and now the problem is, now it's back to square one. It's got factory settings, it's got the default username and password on it, um, you know, some of them have different security measures, but in general that's usually the way it works. It's now got the defaults. So, Anyone that can find your cable modem can probably get into it, uh, and certainly anyone on your network is going to be able to get into it because it's going to have the default username and password. Now, if you're using this for a guest network, so I've seen where companies will take one of these and they'll actually split it off their main network and try to run a guest network isolated from the rest of the network. Well, that's not very secure either. It's not really going to be isolated. Uh, it's not really designed to work that way. You're trying to make a device work in a way it wasn't designed. It's never going to be secure. Uh, it's certainly not going to be auditable. So we do not recommend these in business settings. Technically, I don't recommend the home settings either because you, know, you still do financial stuff for your personal life at home. So there's a minimum set of, <clears throat> of security that I would want to even have in my own home, even though I wasn't a technical person, even though I didn't do technical work. Okay, so the next thing is, these are business class firewalls. Now, the equipment I'm showing, most of this is pretty dated. It's just what I had in a closet, uh, easily accessible. Uh, this is a sonic wall firewall. They, this is an obsolete version, but these are business class. Um, they, they would do everything you wanted them to do, and they had add-ons where you could run uh, intrusion prevention, intrusion detection, content filtering, 
you could even have antivirus or anti-malware on this device that would help protect your network before data even touched your computers. It's trying to filter and block things. They did a pretty good job at it. Um, we, we use uh, Cisco Meraki's with most of our customers. We think they're a, a little bit more superior product, but these are not bad. This is business class. It's a legitimate product, uh, has a legitimate purpose, and it works well. Uh, if you were to buy one of these, the new version of these today, you're probably looking at about $500 uh, roughly to buy one. Uh, the upkeep uh, maintenance subscriptions, which you want to keep up to date, is probably a couple of hundred dollars a year, and that would give you a lot of security. Now, it's not something you're going to put in uh, as a non-technical user. Uh, you could probably pull that off with a Linksys, or you probably have, actually, or have a relative do it. This is not something that's going to go in quite that easy. It's not designed to go in that easy because it has a lot more feature set and functionality. You really want to have a professional install this if you wanted to put one in your home. In your business, it's the same thing. We would not recommend that you put one of these in your business. When we do see people put devices like this in their business, they set up the absolute minimum in security, which usually means no security at all, or it's the defaults. Or they use a simple password. It's just, there are certain standards professionals know to do when they deploy this stuff. So just like the other one, you've got network ports on the back. I've got some cables, uh, ethernet cables just hanging off this one. It'd plug into the internet and go to, uh, your cable modem would go to here, and from here it would go out to your computer, so you'd have a couple of connections. Now this is not a wireless uh, firewall. But I do have a wireless version of basically the same firewall right here. So you got the antennas hanging off. Uh, you don't have to have antennas these days to, to have a wireless device, but most of your devices will have antennas on them if they do have wireless capability. So this is a wireless firewall router. So the other one was a firewall router. We incorporated wireless on this one. Okay, Same basic functions. It's got the same ports. You can run things into it. But now you can manage the wireless on here. Okay, and That's a SonicWall wireless uh, firewall router. Oh, let me cover this real quick. There's a little pinhole on here on the back of these where you can factory reset these as well. Even though they're business class, they haven't taken the ability to reset them out. Now, they've inset it. They've not made it real obvious. And the procedure to reset these is a lot more complex than just holding down on a reset. Okay, So, so keep that in mind. It does protect you from maybe an employee or yourself forgetting yourself and, and trying to reset one of these back to factory settings to get your internet working because... Let's face it, when your internet doesn't work, your business isn't probably going to be producing any, uh, any well, you're not going to have any productivity. So. so this is exactly the same thing as what we were just looking at. So this is a higher end version of a sonic wall. It's a sonic wall, firewall router, and it has wireless. you got the antennas on here. And um, this one is rack mountable. So now all this is, is it's just a firewall mounted to a bracket. We just have the sonic wall bracket in here. And you could mount this in a four post rack or a two post rack uh, inside your closet at your office. Uh, we like this. It gets it nice and clean out of the way. It bolts it down where it's not getting kicked and pushed around. Um, so, so we like to have these things mounted when we can. It's not a requirement, but we do like to have it done that way. Um, these will have, you know, the more money you spend, the more complex features it'll have, more horsepower. Uh, you do have to spend a certain amount of money to get a certain amount of throughput. So like this one's much more high end, it's gonna have a lot more throughput. So if you have a business and you've paid for Cox's fastest internet connection, at, let's say it's 300 megabit down and 50 megabit up. Well, this firewall is probably not gonna be able to have that much throughput. It doesn't have enough processing power. It's gonna be capped, especially if you start turning on all the feature set, intrusion prevention, intrusion detection, antivirus, anti-malware, content filtering, and so on. All those things have to analyze every packet going through the firewall router to be able to make sure if it's safe or should be rejected. Okay, so if you want to have those features and you have a fast internet connection, you're going to have to have a much more powerful firewall router. And this is this is one of the, it's an older version, but this was a more powerful firewall router that we had deployed with a client for many years. Okay, so these. These are, uh, for a long time, ingenious access points were one of the least expensive, more or less business class access points that you could get. Now, I guess I'm jumping ahead. So what is an access point? An access point is a wireless networking device. So we talked about our firewall a minute ago. Let me pull this back over. So this is a, a, wire, a firewall router that has wireless. Well, what we like to do is we like to have all our wireless off the firewall. So pretty much with most of our clients these days, we will 
deploy a firewall, because these usually go in a closet really far away from your employees. Uh, so we'll deploy the firewall. We won't spend the extra money to get the wireless add-on, and then we'll just get a wireless access point. So all this does is enables wireless on your network. Now, they do have a lot of more functionality, usually when you buy a standalone wireless device like this, or a wireless access point, also called a WAP, W-A-P, so WAP. So when you buy one of these devices and you install it, you have to run a cable somewhere in your house, or your, I'm sorry, <laughs> your business, uh, you have to run a cable somewhere in your business or your house, I guess, um, and you would centrally locate this to try to cover as much as your, of your, your office space as you, could, you can. Or you would run more than one. So you'd have an Ethernet cable dangling off here, would connect to that device, and that would be hanging on the ceiling or on the wall. Usually you want the ceiling because they're really designed to, to distribute the signal better that way. So you would hang it on the ceiling, this would be in a closet somewhere, but you got to run cable between the two devices for them to be able to connect. Okay. Now there's different types of devices like this. So this is a ingenious, like I said before, not a big fan of many more. Uh, we used to deploy these quite a bit and they were decent at the time. We've had a lot of problems with them in the last uh, five or so years. So we switched over to using Ubiquiti and uh, uh, Cisco Meraki, depending on the implementation needed. Uh, and those are both very stable. Now there's a lot of the low end companies, uh, Linksys, Netgear, and when I say low end, they're not bad stuff. It's just not things that we want to put into a corporate environment. But they've started to make dedicated access points and they didn't used to have these. What they would have is they would have a firewall router that would have wireless on it, but they've started to push out these wireless access points. Now I can't say whether they're good, they're bad. Uh, I can't really say a whole lot about them. I don't trust them. Uh, we would never deploy them to our business class customers, which is all of our customers. Um, they have a reset button in there. Let's see, the little red dot there. Again, you can reset this thing to factory real easy. Um, they're, they're usually about the same cost as a Ubiquiti, which really is a business class product. So really is no justification for having one of these, we would say, over a Ubiquiti access point if you want to have distributed networking for wireless in your business. Um, so this is another wireless access point. This is another Ingenius that we've pulled out of a, a working shop. Uh, it's a little bit more high end. It's got the four antennas. Um, usually when you see four antennas, it's called MIMO, multiple in, multiple out. Uh, just means it's got a little bit more uh, throughput bandwidth wise. Uh, you'll see that they're not always round. They're sometimes square, they're sometimes hexagonal. They look just like a firewall in a lot of ways. And if you're not sure if that's a firewall or an access point, uh, usually the best way to tell is there is usually only one cable going into your access point. Uh, they're also usually mounted to ceilings, on walls, whereas your firewall may be mounted into a rack or sitting on a shelf, and it's usually sitting right next to your cable modem. So they're usually right next to each other. These devices are usually distributed within your organization. Okay, so now we're going to talk about network switching. So this is a uh, low-end Linksys network switch. Uh, these are, we see these in businesses, a lot of companies will deploy these uh, with, uh, let's say you, you use Cox. Cox might deploy one of these in your small business to be able to connect all your computers directly to their internet as part of their uh, business services. Now I don't know what Cox is using these days, I, I doubt they're using the Linksys, they may be using a Netgear or something, but, but they don't usually use um, what we would consider business grade, Ubiquiti, uh, Cisco, um, Fortinet, there's a bunch of brands out there that we really consider business grade, they're managed, they've got a lot of uh, perks to them. What they're gonna deploy is something like this usually, and it's usually kind of fire and forget. They put it in, they plug everything in, and you kind of hope for the best. What we wanna deploy is devices like this that are smart. Same with our firewalls, and same with our access points. These are devices that we can monitor and manage through the cloud, and when you have problems, we can help you remediate those problems without even a site visit oftentimes. So, so this is a Linksys. We don't recommend Linksys. Um, they're just not usually business class. They're not something that we would want to troubleshoot uh, for your organization. Um, they don't usually have a lot of features set either. So this is a Netgear. Now, you will see these in offices. This is the poor man's <laughs> network port replicator or duplicator. So what it does, when you've got an office, it usually costs about $150 per drop. That's Ethernet cables, right? So a drop is a network cable that goes usually from a networking closet where you have your cable modem and your router and your network switch, your big switch, right, that runs your whole network. Well, maybe you ran only one cable to an office, but now you need to have a computer in there and a printer. Well, you've got a couple options. One is you call a cabling company and they come out and run a cable over to that computer, which is what we consider the right way to do it. 
or you just go buy one of these at Best Buy or Office Depot or whatever. You plug the cable that's coming in there now into one port. You plug, you have two cables coming out. One goes to the computer and one goes to the printer. These will work, but they are a troubleshooting nightmare for your technical staff. So if you call and you have a problem, nine times out of 10, if you have one of these, your computer's not on the internet and your printer doesn't work. And what's happened is someone has this under their desk and they have tripped over the cable and it's unplugged. Or they were looking for another power port and these huge bricks under their desk is taking up all the power ports and they just unplugged it. And now they can't figure out why things don't work. So we don't like having these in the network. If we can help it, we do have to put them in occasionally. It's the customer's choice. Um, you know, it just costs the customer more for support when they do fail, but we discourage it. You're much better off running direct cables, even being on wireless and having one of these hidden somewhere in your office just to have a failure at some point, because it's going to fail, it's going to give you problems, and someone's going to have to roll on site to figure out what's going on, because we can't remotely plug the power into these things. We can't remotely plug the cables in. So the other thing that happens with these is they create a, a mess of cables. Wherever you put this device, usually there's cables hanging off of it and they get ran over by wheels on chairs and they start to get kinked and you start to have a lot of uh, ghosts in your machine is what we like to call it. When the wires are kinked or they're grounding off each other, you're gonna have a lot of problems with data transmission within your network. So we don't recommend these, but they do usually work virtual networking or subnetting. That's what we do to try to start isolating certain data within your network. These switches can do this. The links of switches can't do it as well. So this is an enterprise switch, and it's going to give you a lot of flexibility, but you are gonna pay more for it, you, not like you used to. When I say this is about a $5,000 switch, uh, the newer version of these switches, a 24 port, uh, like a Ubiquiti, uh, you could probably pick one up for about three or $400, and they're gonna last you easily five years, probably even 10 years, as long as you've got it on a good power strip with a uh, battery backup. Okay, so lastly, it's gonna cover uh, this device. <laughs> so when, when you'll see these in your closets, and this is just a punch down block for ethernet. So your ethernet cables will plug into these. I'll grab one real quick. So your ethernet cables will plug into these devices, just like that. And then they'll go down and usually plug into a server, uh, your networking gear, anything in your rack. So these will usually be mounted. Now this is a big one. This is uh, 48 ports. Uh, Usually if you're a small organization, you'll have a eight port or a 12 port, 16 port, 24 port version of this. And so, so this is how your cables in your ceiling will come down and they get punched. So they strip the, the jacket off the cable, they use a tool and they'll punch them down in here so that you can then plug in patch cables to go directly to your systems. What you don't wanna do is you don't want your cables coming into your closet where your networking gear is and then being immediately terminated directly into a server, directly into a, a router or firewall. This gives you control. You can easily label every one of these to match patch panels in your offices. So you can have an office uh, block under a desk. You've seen them where you plug the network cable into your, from your computer into it and it'll have a number on it like D14. Well, you'll have D14 on here. When you use these, instead of having your cables in your, your infrastructure cables coming through your ceiling straight into a server, you've got an easy way to match everything up. It reduces troubleshooting time dramatically for your IT people when they come in. If your organization is clean in appearance and organized and structured and everything's labeled, we can usually solve any problems that come up very quickly. When it's a nest of, of cables and a mess, it's gonna greatly increase the cost and the, well, the time it takes to resolve something, which obviously increases the cost. So with our customers, we always go through their closet, we organize everything, label it. That's part of the onboarding process. If your networking closet is a big old mess of cables, that's not the way it's supposed to be. People come to accept that, well, that's just the way technology works. It is not. Technology should be clean, neat, organized, and supportable. And when it's a mess, if it's a mess to you, it's, it's a mess to us. And that's, that should be remedied in a timely manner to keep your support costs down. So, so what this does is just allows the infrastructure cables in your building to be terminated here, and then you have a central way to connect all these ethernet cables over to your computers, your networking gear, you might have camera system and so on, and it's easily labelable, uh, and it just keeps everything nice and neat. So that's pretty much a uh, bird's eye view of networking. All the devices that kind of make up networking in a small business, what we think you should be doing with the networking equipment in your organization, how things should kind of plug together, um, oh, I do want to show you one thing real quick. So you'll see these quite a bit. We see them at customer sites. This is not networking equipment. This is just an external hard drive. <laughs> so you've probably seen them, but they're, oftentimes you'll find these are being sat with servers and stuff. They'll do like local backups onto them and so on. 
Um, if, if they're being used for local backups and they're on your uh, server rack, just pretty much just ignore them. Let your IT people manage that for you. If it's being used for local backups uh, and it's in your closet, just make sure that it doesn't get disconnected, that your backups are being monitored. Because if they're going on here and no one's monitoring that, you're not going to have good backups. But the only reason I bring this up is it kind of looks like a, a firewall. Uh, and if you see it on a server, you may be trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, that's all it is. It's just an external hard drive. You probably have one at home. Well, that's all I've got. If you have any questions, feel free to, to write some comments or you can contact us directly. Uh, I'm Brian Largent with the ArcLight Group, and this has been a very high-level networking overview. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks.